So, yeah, I, I think we should happily continue, and, and yeah, absolutely. to bring the paper assignments? Oh, no, we did it last week. Oh, last week. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, because they're delivering, I guess they're delivering them late, okay. Do you want to begin? Absolutely. So let us go ahead and begin. And let me do so by discussing quickly our ideas for today's class. We will begin by looking at the readings on the syllabus assigned for last week that we didn't have a chance to get to on the entire vision of desire and the possible fulfillment or lack thereof of desires. And then based on when the discussion side of peters out, probably a little bit less than halfway through the class, we will then turn to the question of how we could rethink and resurrect this entire project based upon the fact that Thus far, we have seen many, um, let's call them, dead ends. We began, of course, with this discussion with the radical claims of individuality that you see in Emerson and Nietzsche, the radical claims of nonconformity, where the radical individual stands against the context into which he or she is born, and we discussed the dangers of that. Very relatedly, we discussed the dangers of the romantic approach, Again, based upon a claim, but here with, with a much more theological bent that we'd explored in depth, that following upon, if we take Hegel's vision of this, the incarnation, if we should be understood as having a divine force, say a spirit or a soul, inhabiting a finite body, then romanticism from this genealogy would be read as we are infinite beings sadly trapped in a finite world of a human body and a structure of society that can do nothing but restrict us and limit us, and therefore our lives are an endless attempt, and therefore a doomed attempt, to battle against these structures, and therefore you get this vision of the, the tragic heroic figure standing against structure until finally, sadly, he is forced to succumb to that structure the standard romantic narrative that we discussed, and we also mentioned the extreme dangers of trying to stick to that in terms of a project. And today we turn to the third general vision emerging out of this project that I think we will all end up very quickly agreeing is a very dangerous one as well. Arguably, of the two that we have looked at so far, um, this might be the more pervasive one, um, chillingly so. So, to introduce the discussion of desire, let me as always begin by looking at our two readings for today, explaining what they're talking about very briefly, and then work out to the larger philosophical implications. So, if within this project, we are concerned with the idea that as great individuals, we, of course, have desires, and if part of the structure of the world means that those desires are endlessly unfulfillable, how then can we deal with the fact that this great individual, living a life of nonconformity, could have his desires finally fulfilled, or if not, what would be the possible ways we would accept a limitation to those desires? We have 
two readings today that give opposite answers to this, and then we will turn to philosophically how we might be closer to both of these thinkers than I suspect we would philosophically want to be in terms of our common assumptions. But first, the readings themselves. Fourier, one of the most influential utopian thinkers of the 19th century, whose argument runs along the following lines. Each one of us, as an individual, has a basic set of desires, and sadly for us, the structure of the civilizations into which we are born prevent us from fulfilling our desires. As a utopian thinker, Fourier, of course, wants us to be able to fulfill our desires, and therefore he comes up with a utopian vision that will be tremendously influential in the two centuries to come of how we could accordingly reorganize the world such that our desires could be completely fulfilled. And very briefly, the answer is that if you actually add up all of our desires, you actually can see that there are a relatively limited number of them. All of us are born with these desires, and there are limited numbers of which ones they are. And so the first move is you work out all the basic desires that humans have, and then you reorganize the world into what he calls phalanxes. And the reason for this is, since there are a restricted number of desires, your goal is to allow everyone to fulfill their desires in a way that won't infringe upon anyone else's fulfilling their desires, because you want complete fulfillment. And what the phalanx allows you to do is to organize a relatively small number of people, perfectly organized, because therefore everyone with the key number of desires can also all play out all that they want to do in this utopian world, their desire is fully co completed, and there'll be no possibility of, of sort of having too many people with this desire or too many people of that desire because you'll perfectly coordinate it. And so you organize the world under these phalanxes. And therefore, he will, in his work, give you all of these possible desires, how they can all be learned, worked, organized, I should say, to match everyone else's desires, the precise number of people that can be within each phalanx, and the result will be no more dealing with our unfulfilled desires because we can completely achieve them. Now, this may seem on the face of it so utterly absurd, you might be wondering why we're reading this. Well, first let me mention the influence, but then after a discussion of Freud, the larger philosophical implications, but first the influence. The influence will be extraordinary. To give one of the more recent examples, a very significant thinker called Herbert Marcuse will give a very similar answer to this, and he will become one of the major theorists in the huge youth revolution of the 1960s, all of which is based upon civilization pre prevents us from fulfilling our desires. We need to reorganize the world in a utopian way that can allow us to fulfill our desires. And basically, it's the same rhetoric, minus the, the seemingly absurd notion of a phalanx, that we see as early as Fourier. Um, soon, we'll see it's more chilling, his influence, than just that. But let me quickly turn to our second reading that might seem radically different, because, of course, Freud, our second figure, gives the exact opposite response normatively about how we should deal with the fact that we have these individual desires. Freud's response very quickly is, he agrees with Fourier that civilization inherently requires us to be unable to fulfill our desires. There's an inherent distinction thereof. Instead of Fourier's response, let's therefore organize the world into a series of phalanxes where we can perfectly fulfill our desires. Fourier's response is, since we cannot fulfill our desires, we sublimate our desires in these very, very dangerous ways, psychologically dangerous for us as individuals, socially very dangerous in terms of the behaviors it will create. And therefore, the goal of Freud is to develop a therapy practice in which we can learn to sublimate our desires more effectively. So you try to develop a better superego than the ones that we will tend to have. That better superego will allow you both individually to channel your desires. Um, they're being repressed, but that repression is channeled in more productive ways. And 
allows you, therefore, socially to build a world, not where our desires will be fulfilled, but at least where the repression of our desires will not be the simple repression model, it'll be a sublimation model, where we can get something like a fulfillment of versions of our desires in ways that will not be overly harmful to us psychologically, as individuals, or to the rest of the world. And of course, the larger project here of things like psychoanalysis is to provide the kind of therapy that will allow us to so properly sublimate our desires. Now, here too, you are probably wondering, fine and good, but what is the larger philosophical significance of these two thinkers for our project in this class? So now, let me lay that out. This claim that individuals have an inherent set of desires that are presently being unfulfilled is a key characteristic of this entire project of self-construction that we have been discussing. And if particularly the Fourier response seems a little absurd <laughs> and the Freudian response seems perhaps a little limited, um, let me make an argument about a commonsensical way, particularly in America, that we tend to think about the self and the organization of society with the argument that it's a lot closer to Fourier than we might want to admit, with little pieces of Fourier sort of tossed in. And my argument is the following. So here's a standard, more American way of putting basically the same argument that we've been discussing. Every individual has desires. And we as individuals want to live in a world where we could completely fulfill our desires. And unlike all of those horrible civilizations that existed throughout world history, we want to create one where we can fulfill our desires. And luckily, and you might think we don't hold the position I'm about to say, but as I'll mention with examples, I think we do. Luckily, there are a set number of these desires. Now, you might think, no, 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 we, we don't give that assumption. So that's a place where we depart from Fourier. We do. Let me give you a few examples before I work out the implications that we tend to take for granted. So we have now designed personality tests that everyone can take. Those personality tests will tell you who you are as a person and what sets of things, career choices, partner, li partners, lifestyles, etc., will allow you to live a fulfilled life. Needless to say, the key for personality test is there are a limited number of these, and we're going to see which ones you are, which one <laughs> you are. There's not an infinite variety, there's a set number. And you will take this test, and literally, I haven't taken it, but I've seen the results worked out, it will tell you, here are the career options in which you will be fulfilled, here are the career options in which you won't be fulfilled, here are the lifestyles in which you'll be fulfilled, here are the lifestyles in which you would not, here's the type of partner you would like to be with in the future, here's the types of partner you should avoid like the plague, and if you follow this, you will lead a wonderfully fulfilled life. We don't organize the world according to phalanxes, but note the way we think we're organizing the world basically accomplishes the same goal. So the phalanx idea is we can organize the set number of desires in ways where everyone's desire will play off perfectly with everyone else's within this restricted number. Basically, our hope is kind of the same thing. It's simply by instead of scaling down, you scale up. It's basically a version of sort of 19th century liberal theory talking about rational self-interest, right? So the basic standard argument, as we've mentioned before, in 19th century liberal arguments is every individual has a rational self-interest. If you create a world where everyone can freely play out their rational self-interest, as long as you scale up to a large-scale society, everyone's rational self-interest will be allowed to play off everyone else's and you can create a perfectly harmonious world. Basically, the standard American vision of desires is pretty much the same thing. You don't have to organize phalanxes, you simply scale up. So if everyone can play out their desires, over the course of a large society, basically, there are going to be enough careers for people who are type, personality type, you know, A63, <laughs> and, and enough potential partners for those who are 2B8, and everyone will 
perfectly end up in a free world perfectly correlating with everyone else. All of our desires will be fulfilled. And more recently, of course, we have all of these technologies that will help us. So on the partner issue, how do you like link up with a perfect person who will, will, you can be connected with because we're not organizing the world according to phalanxes? Don't worry, because of course we have all of these techniques, Google, Facebook, et cetera, that will work out who you are as a person, what you like, what you don't like, and then perfectly connect you with people who perfectly fit you, perfectly. Fourier would have loved this. <laughs> everyone will be perfectly connected to everyone else. There's no overarching organizing principle other than simply the scaling up, that enough people out there, everyone can be connected with everyone else perfectly. It's straight Fourier. We have a little bit of Freud because, for example, what if my innate desire is I like to be horribly violent? Well, that's where we sprinkle in a little bit of Freud, because obviously if I have a desire to be violent, then I'll be put into therapy from a young age, and hopefully that will be sublimated in a more helpful way where I can play you know, violent video games as opposed to playing out violence in a social world. If it can't be successfully sublimated, I'll be repressed in a, in a more institutional form by being put in jail. But basically, it's sort of a little bit of Freudianism tossed on if sadly, some of our desires cannot be fu completely fulfilled. But it is a little sprinkling. No, the basic idea is everyone's desires will be fulfilled. Again, as long as they're not so horribly <laughs> um, painful to, to, to everyone else, then everything will be fine. In short, what I'd like to say is the following. If in this project of self-construction, we have seen in each stage sort of pieces of the philosophical positions that we've been looking at playing out, each of these we've seen in very dangerous ways, but then playing out in contemporary American culture in perhaps arguably more dangerous ways, I think we see it here too. If what we looked at with Emerson and Nietzsche was this notion of the radical individual with his authentic true self radically opposed to the world around him, again, the more Americanized version of that is look within, discover your true authentic self, and live your life according to it. If in Romanticism, the claim is the structured world prevents us from our infinite ability to create anew radically, then again, the Americanized version of this is simply celebrate that radical individual with that radical individual's radical innovation and creativity, and then sort of de facto um, ignore the fact that, that the structures prevent that. Um, just to give an example I mentioned in passing before, um, I, I, I'll even give actually an example, not an example I gave before, I'll use a very specific example. Um, I had a student who was very excited, just brilliant, brilliant computer programmer who got a job working at one of the startups in Silicon Valley. And he was so excited about this. Um, he goes at the beginning of the day, every single day, the CEO of this you know, tiny, tiny startup stands up saying, we are going to disrupt the world. Your goal here all day long is to disrupt the world. It's going to be so exciting. And what my student did was spend the entire summer writing another messaging app to compete with the you know, 10,000 other messaging apps out there. Um, he said it was a standard nine to five job, kind of miserable like all nine to five jobs are with a very set round of duties. The worst part of it, however, instead of saying, okay, this is just a miserable nine to five job, so instead of you know, cooking Big Macs, you're gonna be <laughs> doing this work, it was all clothed in the language of radical disruption. So I would use that to make the larger point. I think we have a very romanticized vision of our lives, um, and then we just kind of ignore the fact or <laughs> that, that what we're really doing, and so you claim ah, we're disrupting structures when in fact we, in our daily lives, are usually doing nothing of the same. And I would make the same point about today's concern, desire. Basically, it's the same view. We're basically watered down Ferrarians, <laughs> right? We basically think it's all about every individual fulfilling their desires, and by scaling up, we can create a perfectly, we'll use the term that we so often used in America, free, liberated world in which we can all fulfill our desires. When we do so, we're being Fourier. And 
to make the larger point, which I'm sure is now clear, it is every bit as dangerous as the two other <coughs> dangers that have played out within this tradition. From that point of view, you're actually not in any manner, shape, or form thinking about creating a world where we could truly flourish because the whole assumption of the radical individual self and the fulfillment of desires ironically works to take that out of the picture, right? It's all about, in assumption, the world that, that exists, as long as it's freed from things, will allow us to perfectly fulfill our, all of our desires. And so therefore, you don't have to think, how would we recreate the world, alter the world, change the world, except in the minimal things where there seems to be a boundary that we need to disrupt and break down so that our desires can be completely fulfilled. But with that very, very <laughs> minor restriction, basically the world that we are already living in, especially in a place like America, is already accomplishing it. You don't have to question that. You certainly don't have to question the self and build a different self. On the contrary, it's all about accepting what you currently have as being somehow your true authentic self with a set of inherent desires that now we are simply allowing ourselves to fulfill. If, needless to say, the entire vision of self-construction is ended up being reduced to this, then that project is in grave danger. Luckily, I think at least that point that we have created a world that has maintained all the rhetoric of this project and yet is hardly creating the radically disruptive world that we claim it is creating, um, the good side of that, the possible silver lining of that, is hopefully that will encourage us to do what we'll be turning to next, which is to say, how could we rethink this project in a way that would avoid any of these three dangers that we have portrayed, the most recent one, the claim of the fulfillment of the desires, simply being the latest and in a sense kind of a <laughs> playing out of the same permutation in terms of its dangers that we have seen in the previous two as well. With that as a previous, as a very brief introduction, Roberto, should we turn things to you yeah, or should why, we for why begin by open opening up things up? Let's open, thing, yep, let's open things up. I can see you're all convinced by Fourier. <laughs> so maybe Michael, I'll, oh, please. Oh, yes, please. I just have a quick comment. Yes. I think that's a really good point. Um, well, I think that I was talking Yes. Yes. Absolutely. And I think you're both right in that point and absolutely right on the larger implications. The reason reading a figure like Fourier can be so uh, worthwhile in a negative sense is precisely this, that these utopias so easily turn into chilling dystopias. And I think it's worth asking if in our current assumptions in America, that isn't exactly what is happening. Right, with this cult of the radical individual following and fulfilling their true authentic self and having their desires that, they're in, that are inherent in their true self being perfectly fulfilled, have we not become in danger of creating a world that is highly dystopic in which we lock ourselves into a predefined rigid view of what this authentic self is, in which we lock ourselves into a vision of the, what the fulfillment of this authentic self would entail, and we lock ourselves into not thinking about the larger structural order that is allowing all of this to occur, all of which is simply seen as as long as it's, it's, we can fulfill our desires with personality tests and, and Facebook, et cetera, perfectly fine. Or again, when critique happens, it's simply in a place where we, our, our fulfillment is not complete, meaning we don't really question the structural world in which we are living. So yes, I, I think your point is outstanding. Has our <laughs> utopia built upon this world not falling into a dystopia exactly, as you said, sort of a Fourier played out, can play into a brave new world? And are we perhaps in danger of living that out? Yeah, excellent point. Yes, please. Like European model is much more like trade school. So 
women, given that we're sort of expecting the American model as, as much as the English, do you restrict ourselves to like the self that we define as opposed to, so I'm just wondering, like, as opposed to the Europeans, it almost sounds like you could do that even earlier. I, I agree. So yeah, I agree. The way that distinction is often put from a sort of self-congratulatory American perspective is, well, in Europe, you must choose your profession much earlier. So as you said, you therefore apply to a college to do X that you've already decided upon. Um, you actually apply to literally the department that, that will train you to do X. And so the, the college experience is really one of training you to do something you've already agreed to do. Um, and the self-congratulatory version in America is to say, oh, we on the contrary give, first of all, longer, so it's a four-year as opposed to a three-year program, and you apply to a university, you, you write an essay you know, claiming who you are as a person, but you don't pre-commit yourself to a career or, or a, a concentration, and we allow you in those four years to really find yourself. So that's the self-congratulatory way we often put it. Um, I think the way you put it is the more accurate one. Um, we like to claim this liberates all of you in these four years to really find yourself and be true liberated individuals. The danger of this, of our rhetoric of the self in this kind of dangerous way it's played out, would be to say, no, actually what we're really asking you to do, and even worse because we're not even sort of forcing this on you institutionally, we're actually claiming what I'm about to say in term as a sort of set of practices that liberates you. We are asking you to spend, usually your high school years is when this begins, spend those key years finding yourself, finding your true authentic self, find who you are, what will liberate you and allow you to be fulfilled as a unique individual. Again, involves things like personality tests, et cetera. So there's a sense that there are a set number of <laughs> unique figures out there. Um, once you figure which one you are, it helps by things like personality tests, et cetera. You write this college essay presenting yourself as a unitary self in which all of your activities have led to the, the future career that of course we know is a fiction, but by asked to do this, we're sort of normatively claiming that should be the case. Then you get into a college, it's all about finding, it's all about exploring, but it's all within the rhetoric of, again, continuing the work of finding yourself. So if you've done what you're supposed to do in high school according to this vision, over the course of the freshman year, you take courses widely, but all about really fully finding yourself. Then you're ready by your sophomore year to commit to a concentration because now you know who you really are and what career option will really fulfill you. Then you design that concentration and your extracurriculars to, to help propel you as this unique individual toward that future. So yeah, we give four years. You don't have to pre-commit to a major. Um, I'm not sure it's that much better, and I worry it may even be more dangerous because we're less honest about what we're really saying. Um, the danger of what we're really saying is you have some pre-given self already there. You're going to find it, and the current set of, to look at a philosophical tradition we'll be looking at in two, two, two weeks and to switch to that vocabulary, current sets of ruts, patterns, habits that you've fallen into, you're going to define as you, and you're going to base your entire career, your life choices, your lifestyle, future partners, based upon these habits you happen to have fallen into. And we're gonna organize society at least claiming that you'll be able to so organize your life, and if you can, you'll lead a happy, fulfilled life. So ironically, in all of this claim of liberation, are we not, on the contrary, restricting people to an incredibly narrow, rigid view of the self that they must decide on by basically you know, high school or at least sophomore year of college that then we're saying should define their entire existence and somehow this will lead to happiness and fulfillment, even though objectively and empirically that seems very obviously not to be occurring. So I agree and I think it's a good example of the way this this whole project has become shifted in the sort of three philosophical <laughs> ways we've been discussing into an institutional and cultural order in contemporary America that's very dangerous, incredibly confining, incredibly limiting, and all the more so because we claim it's 
freeing us and liberating us and allowing us to disrupt the world around us, when arguably it's doing the precise opposite in all three counts. Other thought? Oh, yes, is that a, a hand movement? Um, I have two more. <laughs> yes. 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 How often? How, how often are we supposed to take this personality test? And, and great question. I'll begin with that, that second question. The answer is once. And I think that's key because what's really going on here, and this will be a, a nice segue a few minutes off um, to what we'll be turning to next, is implicit in this claim is that our desires are not insatiable, right? Implicit in this claim is, no, 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 it's a set number of desires and you can completely, utterly, totally fulfill them as long as you figure out which personality type you are, and you're allowed to play that out. Um, not, again, because of Fourier organizing the world according to phalanxes, but because, again, we'll scale up and, and use Facebook and, and, and personality tests to connect everyone. So the answer is, oh, you only need to take it once because you have a authentic self. It's already there. The test is just simply finding out what it is and how it'll be fulfilled. So you take the test once, <laughs> and all of the other things we mentioned, you do once, because again, it's already there, it's not changing, it's there, you find it and, and program your life accordingly. And somehow, that will lead to fulfillment. And that's, that gets perfectly to your first question, too. Uh, I agree completely. Um, in this claim of radical freedom, what we're not posing is exactly that question. I mean, doesn't this assume a very bourgeois, way of life that by definition is not in any manner, shape, or form being questioned, nor is the social structure that this is based upon being in any manner, shape, or form questioned. Because again, you sort of take that out of the discussion. It's simply about breaking down those barriers and, and creating things like the personality test, et cetera, that will allow us to achieve our fulfillment. So you cut out all of the key questions. I mean, ironically, it's sort of doing at the level of the self and desire exactly what in our very first or first full week, our second week we were discussing about the way academic analytic philosophy works when it defines ethical choices. And as we noted, the whole working of it takes out what you would think would be the key questions about <laughs> how to rethink the self and how to rethink the world around us. All of this rhetoric about fulfilling the desires of the authentic self essentially in practice works the same way. So you don't pose the very question that I think you're very correctly asking. So in all of these debates, there are two questions that are distinct but connected. Uh, what are we like now? And who should we become? And uh, those, uh, uh, the, the problem with the, these ideas that we're calling the paradise of desire is that they make, uh, they, they make a mistake in answering both those questions. And the mistake in answering the second, who should we become, is related to the mistake in answering the first, what are we like now? So there, there, are, there are two ways to, to approach this vision that we are here calling the paradise of desire in relation to our program of inquiry in the course. Uh, one way is to think of it as a variant, a, a bastardized variant of this project of nonconformity and self-invention. But another way is to think of it as a false escape uh, from the problems with which that project confronts us. The project of nonconformity and self-invention is, in a sense, a heroic project. And it does require from its votaries uh, an intense engagement of effort, and especially effort at self-transformation. And at the most simple level, 
these ideas of the paradise of desire uh, represent an exemption from that heroic task. And it's as if they offered us an easy path. But the easy path turns out to be an illusion. So we, we find this idea here in the, in the readings in two forms that, as Michael said, seem to be opposite, but are in fact just the reverse side of each other. The euphoric form in Fourier, as described by Barth, and the deflationary, depressed form that we find in Freud. <coughs> but it's the same fundamental idea that the, the center of our experience is pleasure and the repression of pleasure. And the extent to which society can or cannot be organized to fulfill pleasure as opposed to repressing it. That's the fundamental problem. And if we think in that way, then we would have uh, a method to circumvent all of these problems of the heroic project of nonconformity and self-invention. The problem is that we can't circumvent in that form because we're not like that. And we have no reason to become like that. Uh, and that then provides an occasion to make a series of connected claims about the nature of our desires. So first, that human desires are indeterminate. They're not scripted. They're not like the instincts of the old animal ethology. They have a roving, relatively empty character. In the second place, human desire bears the imprint of the dialectic of transcendence and finitude. We desire, we, ex we experience a temporary satiation uh, and then boredom, uh, one of the most terrible human experiences that, uh, uh, according to Nietzsche, the gods themselves are powerless against boredom and which is the weight of this unused capacity of our transcendence. And then we desire more, and we're, we're chained to this, to this wheel of endlessly dissatisfied desire that projects forward. That's what desire is like. It's not as if there were a finite list with a defined quantum that could be satisfied. Then the third characteristic of human desire related to its emptiness and to its transcendent character uh, is that desire is mimetic. So to a very large extent, we desire what other people desire. And the experience of human desire is in part an experience of being captured, of being kidnapped by the others. And uh, so then the whole life of desire is poisoned by our ambivalence to the others. We need the others, but we fear them. And we have reason to fear them. They place us in jeopardy of losing distinction and freedom. That's this problem of the self and the other that we have to solve at the highest level by love and at another level by cooperation. And in the fourth place, desire is projected. So in desiring something, we in fact always desire something else beyond it that we cannot name. And then this desire for the unlimited, for the absolute, for the nameless, is then projected on a second sense of projection and to some paltry surrogate for it, which is incapable in the end of satisfying us. Uh, and that, I'm claiming, is what desire is really like. If desire is really like that, 
these phalanxes that Fourier describes will not work. And we cannot solve the problem either in the way that Freud describes by the sublimation of frustrated desire into something else. Because whatever we turn desire into will continue to have the same characteristics. Now, a revealing sidelight on this problem of pleasure as both a concealment and a revelation of who we are has to do with so-called possessive materialism or individualism, the accumulation of things. Because the accumulation of things is a specific form of the life of desire, very important in these societies. And there we have the image of Robinson Crusoe on his island accumulating things. And it has been said that the accumulation of things is one of the constructive principles of the early European novel, especially the early English novel. Why do people accumulate things? They accumulate things so as not to depend on people. So the principle is pleasure and accumulation are ultimately solitary. And they are an attempt to escape from social interdependence. But the escape fails. In the end, Robinson Crusoe, no matter how many things he accumulates on his island, wants to return to the company of his fellows in a real society. He wants to go back to England. And the accumulation of things is not uh, uh, an escape from, 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 from this imperative. Now, just to further develop that point, let me read you some fragments from a famous passage of Tocqueville's from the second volume of Democracy in America. It's from the chapter called Why the Americans are so restless in the midst of their prosperity. And it's on this point of the relation between the limitations of pleasure and the limitations of material accumulation. In America, I saw the freest and most enlightened men placed in the happiest circumstances that the world affords. It seemed to me as if a cloud habitually hung upon their brow. And I thought them serious and almost sad, even in their pleasures. In the United States, a man builds a house in which to spend his old age, and he sells it before the roof is on. He plants a garden and lets it just as the trees are coming into bearing, and so forth. If his private affairs leave him any leisure, he instantly plunges into the vortex of politics. And if at the end of a year of unremitting labor he finds he has a few days vacation, his curiosity whirls him over the vast extent of the United States. And he will travel 1,500 miles in a few days to shake off his happiness. Death at length overtakes him, but it is before he is weary of his bootless chase, of that complete felicity which forever escapes him. To these causes must be attributed that strange melancholy which often haunts the inhabitants of democratic countries in the midst of their abundance, and that disgust at life which sometimes seizes upon them in the midst of calm and easy circumstances. Enjoyments are more intense than in the ages of aristocracy, and the number of those who partake in them is vastly larger. 
But on the other hand, it must be admitted that man's hopes and desires are often blasted, and the soul is more stricken and perturbed, and care itself more keen. So that's why the paradise of desire fails, because we're not like the way in which the, the theoreticians, the philosophers of the philosophy of desire say we are. So it's not an escape from the problems of the project of nonconformity and self-invention. It's a circuitous route back into those same problems. Let's throw it out again. Please. Yes. And it particularly goes in this pitfall, which I always see being so prevalent in the society in which we live, and particularly when we talk about the question of desire, our entire um, system of capitalism seems to rest on this. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, and <laughs> every time we delve into these, um, it's also seeing more and more inescapable because every portion of society in which we could hope to participate uh, mirrors some of these pitfalls that you described. Yes. Even in our kind of philosophy where we're disruptive and against society, there's equally um, dangerous pitfalls of perhaps like nihilism or um, complete loss of meaning. Yes. When in fact, there's equally dangerous aspects of them, and it comes to the forefront. But if I could, I but if I could answer you before before hearing from others, I think you're not doing justice to the spirit of the argument because you have evoked just what you call the pitfalls, the dangers, the cost. But that's just half of it, because the other half is about hope, and the question is. How can our hope survive? How can it survive purified of, of the element of illusion, of false transcendence? So uh, to my mind, the, the object at the end of the day is not the vindication of skepticism or nihilism. It's the purification of our hopes. So thus the, the focus on how these projects that we're considering, and especially the two major ones that are here at the center of our inquiry, um, self-invention, nonconformity on one side, solidarity and responsibility on the other, intimately related to the twin imperatives of the contemporary societies, of the enhancement of agency and the improvement of the ability to cooperate, how those two projects can be revised so that our, our, our hope, rather than giving way simply to nihilism, would be elevated, would be expunged of the taint of illusion, which, which, which threatens to corrupt it. And that's how I see the inquiry. But if we do that, which is this, this spirit of philosophy, we take our life in our hands, because we we, we can't subject ourselves to this inquiry without running the risk that nihilism will in the end triumph. So we have to run that risk. Otherwise, we condemn ourselves to the lullabies, to the feel-good stories that uh, abound in the history of philosophy and of religion.
Did you do it? Yes, please. Oh, I, I agree completely. <laughs> yes, I, I think it's, it's another perfect example where if a Fourier could have seen the way all of this is being done in modern America, he would say, oh my gosh, this is incomparably better than a phalanx. <laughs> and the answer is yes. I mean, the great thing about virtual, I'm not saying horrible thing, but the great thing from a Fourier perspective about virtual reality is exactly what you said. It allows you to completely fulfill all of your, your conceivable desires in a world that you can truly tell yourself really is the world you're living in. And the more you can do that is the more to any conceivable degree where the, where the phalanx wouldn't quite be able to fulfill all desires. Well, with virtual reality, you could take away all of those restraints. And yet, going back to my, my poor student being told oh, you're being so radically disruptive, it, it functions kind of similarly. Like, you know, one of my summer jobs was working at McDonald's. And literally, when I worked at McDonald's, everything is by a little buzzer that goes off. When the buzzer goes off, you flip the hamburger. When the buzzer goes off, you sear the meat. When another buzzer goes off, you squirt the, the standard amount of, of sauce onto the bun. And, and you know that's what you're doing. No, like, person who's running a McDonald's would walk into us before it begins and say, oh, you're going to disrupt the world, and this is so exciting. It's like, no, you're being paid to follow this little buzzer, period. And then here's my poor student, who literally his summer job, when he describes his daily work, was identical to mine doing McDonald's, and he's being told, oh, but <laughs> you're being so radically disruptive. Now, in that case, the sad thing from a Fourier perspective is, you know, my student by day two <laughs> had seen through all of this language of disruption. But getting back to your question, imagine virtual reality, where sadly at some point you run out of batteries and so you, <laughs> you're forced to confront the fact that the, the world doesn't really operate this way. But that's an ultimate limit. The truth is for much of your daily work, you're living in a world where all of your desires seem perfectly fulfillable. And again, the, the danger is that the implication of this is, again, you don't question the self. You don't question the world we're living in. It's all allowing you to fulfill your desires, not ultimately, but to enough of an extent that all of those problems don't need to be questioned. So yeah, I think we, we are living in a world that's all about fulfilling desires, finding your authentic self, all within these incredibly restrictive visions of what that means. And I think the implications are horrific. And the fact that we're getting technologically so good at doing this at levels that a Fourier couldn't have even imagined is something we should all be very frightened about. Yes. Yes, please. Sure, go ahead, yeah. So uh, I think I, for my part, I can't accept this simple contrast between the period of questioning and the period of commitment. Uh, it's not as if you were first trying to clarify the assumptions on which you act, and then in a second stage of existence, act. Uh, it, it can't be like that. So you, you, you clarify your ideas while you are acting. And there has to be this dialectical relation between your, your experience and your beliefs. So it continues. Uh, it's not like an engineering process in which you're 
establishing the constraints and the premises, and then you build a thing. That's not what it's like. And uh, otherwise, we would confront that problem that I called mummification, in which we settle on a formula. The formula isn't just a formula of action. It's a formula of a way of being, a rigidified form of the self. And on that, on that formula, we begin to die. So that's not a solution. That's not the way to think of it. And we have to have a different understanding of the relation between engagement and reflection, in which the two are partners forever until the end, uh, and not just for some antecedent period in which we establish the premises. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. So, but then there's this objective question about human existence, and I would want to argue, I have argued here, that one of the uh, incurable flaws in the human condition is our groundlessness. We are unable definitively to clarify the framework of our existence the ground of being. Now, there are philosophies and religions that claim to do that, but I think it's a mistake, and that's not what things are like. And so we, we uh, it, it can't be that the reflection that allows us to orient ourselves depends on the view that we, at a certain moment, discover the definitive foundation, the bedrock, and that's it. Uh, so then we, we have to believe that our, our condition, our existence, allows us to do that. Some of us don't believe that. I don't believe that. Uh, and that, there, that we are able definitively to clarify the framework of existence. Does that then mean that we're lost? That we're unable to orient ourselves? So that, that's, that's the question that you raise. And I think that the, uh, and it's something that's in dispute in the, in the history of philosophy and in the history of religion. Yes? How can you make a claim to absolute groundlessness if you yourself are groundless? And in the same way, how can we question rationality and free will if it is chaos or random? Well, I'm not sure what work the adjective absolute is doing there. You say absolute groundlessness. Uh, the, the, the question is, can we establish the framework, the foundations of existence? Uh, can we resolve the enigma of existence or not? So remember, in the very first class, I said, classical conception of philosophy is Philosophy is a super science in the service of self-help. Super science means it's a theory of the foundations. It says, this is what the world is really like. So Schopenhauer says, my philosophy is the definitive solution to the enigma of existence. That's a super science. And 
The super science in the history of philosophy has characteristically been in the service of self-help. Self-help against fear. The fear and the confusion aroused by these flaws in the human condition. Our mortality, our groundlessness, and our insatiability. So uh, what if we're unable to determine the foundations definitively? And what if the confrontation with these flaws of our mortality, our groundlessness, and our insatiability is something that we neither can nor should want to avoid? Because it's that confrontation that wakes us up from our slumber, from routine, to the possession of life. So that's part of this whole argument. And in my interventions in the course, I'm not proceeding on the premise of the belief in that kind of philosophy as a super science of the foundations. And I am denouncing and repudiating the the search for self-help against these flaws in the human condition, rather than taking them as something that we should explain away or find solace for, I think we need to see them for what they are and to confront them, because they are the condition of our liberation, of our empowerment. So it's a different view of the situation of the work of philosophy, and of the best prospect of a response. That's not a framework in which we're proceeding. That's the basis on which I'm proceeding. <laughs> and uh, uh, just to make explicit the, the how I come to these disputes in the history of philosophy. To, to make it, I, I don't believe in the project of a philosophical super science. And I think that on the whole, it has become unbelievable. Meaning that even those who would want to believe in it are unable to. And that's why what has succeeded the project of a philosophical super science is something much, much smaller, which is, which I call the thought police. Then the philosophers are to tell you how to argue and how to think in this or that domain and how to distinguish a fallacious argument from a good one and so forth. That's what has, in fact, succeeded and re replaced the idea of a philosophical super science. So I think we need something different from those two models, because one is unbelievable and illusory, and the other is a complete abdication of what is important about philosophy, which is the attempt to think and talk about what matters most, to go up to the very limit. That's what philosophy is for. And it can't be that we'll say, we'll only talk about what matters most if we're confident in having this super science that reveals the foundations. It's either that or nothing. Uh, it's either that or total darkness and confusion. That is a, 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 a misrepresentation, to my mind, a fundamental misrepresentation of our options. Was your hand up? Yes.
Mm-hmm. I sympathize with you. So <laughs> Indeed. It's, it's, it's one way of explaining the, the, the motivations of this position that I'm defending about, about method. So, and I think that uh, it's much more important to try to give an example of how we can proceed forcefully without relying on this idea of the philosophical super science than it is to reflect abstractly about what the methodological alternatives are. So to my mind, that's the most important thing I can do here. It's to give an actual example of how to go at these problems uh, without making the assumptions of the classical metaphysicians. Yes, please. Well, yes, of course. So, so, yes. So, so, what's the picture? The picture is that we're surrounded on all sides by darkness, but we can increase the little area of light, which is ours. And in that area of light, our beliefs are corrigible in the light of experience, of discovery, of 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 insight. So we do have the ability to understand. And how do we understand something? We, we understand a phenomenon by understanding what it can become. So insight into the actual is always connected to the imagination of the possible. Not the remote possible, but the adjacent possible. What can happen next? So, for example, we have certain projects of existence. We discover that they're flawed in certain ways. That's the main subject matter here of our course. What can we turn them into so that we don't, we don't have to approach them on a take it or leave it basis? And, and in that process of correcting them, of improving them, we are guided by all the forms of our experience. So in that sense, our ideas are corrigible, although they are not foundational. And corrigibility, real corrigibility on this view, is better than the pretense of foundationalism. And uh, that's the conception of, of the work of philosophy on which, on which I'm proceeding here. Uh, and it then, so uh, if you take the slogan or the principle, a human being becomes more human by becoming more godlike. But godlike by the possession of the divine attribute of transcendence. There is more than in him than there is in the context. He spills over. But not godlike in the sense of omnipotence or omniscience. That's Prometheanism. That's self-deification. And uh, so that's a, that would be a, misrepre a misrepresentation of our, of our circumstance. And those ideas are all involved in the criticism of these, of these projects. So, 
you know, and the, the as, as I think I said on the very first day of class, uh, I approach uh, I approach these philosophical debates from a very particular standpoint, which is a standpoint that is political in the large sense, not in the small sense. So for example, right now, we're discussing what we've labeled this project of nonconformity and self-invention. This project is one of the many variants of a larger undertaking in the world over the last two or 300 years. It is a revolutionary program for the emancipation and empowerment of ordinary men and women that has had two faces. One face is the political face of the doctrines of democracy, liberalism, socialism. The other is the personalist faith of romanticism, uh, in the, also in the large sense, as in the, the global popular romantic culture, with its message that the ordinary person is not so ordinary, but has in him the divine, the higher, the potential to ascend to a higher form of life. So this project has set the world on fire for the last two or three centuries. The world is in a revolutionary process. Now, my life happens to have fallen in what I hope will be a brief counter-revolutionary interlude in this long revolutionary period in the history of humanity. And I'm not going to let my ideas and actions be controlled by the assumptions and habits of mind and compromises of the counter-revolutionary interlude. I want the revolutionary project to continue. That's my basic attitude in, in engagement with this. But it's now in this paradoxical situation. It remains the most powerful project in the world because it commands the agenda. It has enemies. But all the other projects in the world respond to it. It continues to command the agenda. But at the same time that it appears to be strong, to have unparalleled strength, it is weak because its adepts, like me, no longer know what its next step should be. And if it can't be reinvented, then it begins to wane uh, and to disappear. The only way to keep it alive is to reinvent it. This is the, the, the fundamental paradox in the life of the spirit, that we can preserve only what we renounce and reinvent. Uh, and so then the question is, what are its next steps politically? That would, in the institutional imagination, the reinvention of the forms of democracy and of decentralized economy. And what are its next steps morally? That's the main object of discussion here in this course. So that's the spirit in which I'm engaging in this. I don't have to pretend to a foundational philosophical super science to engage in that project. That would only be a distraction uh, and, and an illusion from, from this effort. So that's how I'm seeing it. But each of you could see it in a different way, because each of you could come to it with, uh, from, a, from a different set of in, engagements, assumptions, aspirations. But I'm just trying to be entirely explicit about my motivations in this, in this argument. Yes, please.
Oh, no, please, please. No, you, 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 you start. You sure. Start <laughs> Absolutely. Um, the answer could be potentially yes, but the reason I use the, the word potentially in, in, in sort of an emphatic tone would be um, it, the danger would be are we then questioning all of the things that are leading us to, t to even use the language of desire and fulfillment. Um, and what I mean by that specifically is the entire vision of the self, the entire um, structural setup of the world, institutionally and culturally, that is projecting the self. And the reason I want to begin there is if we say um, the goal is to train ourselves to desire the pleasure of seeking desire with, with, while knowing we'll never achieve fulfillment, um, the danger is are we still taking for granted pre-given notions of the self and pre-given notions of the, of the world into which we're born. A particularly strong danger, again, if we're talking about contemporary America, where so much of that language of the self, the liberation of the self, disrupting the world around us, is so pre-given in what I would say from the outside is a very rigidified, stable vision of the self, a rigidified, stable, unquestioning vision of the proper structure of the world and the proper structure of society. Within that context, the danger would be, would that formulation in itself help push us to question the self and to help push us to question the world within, the, within, within which the self is situated? Now, that being said, as a sort of negative point, let me then flip gears immediately and say, um, if on the contrary, the formulation is one where you are actively trying to question all that I mentioned, then absolutely you're right. Then we still have to return to the question of, well, are we comfortable with the language of desire and how would we reconceptualize it while we're trying to question this and what would it mean, therefore, to use a language of desire and use a language of, of even fulfillment if we want to, to use that term once we begin to question all that I mentioned. So in a way I'd say um, as long as we're questioning all of the, the key assumptions that lead to the world that a Fourier and a Freud are, are de facto taking for granted, um, then it opens up the questions you're raising. Yep, absolutely. Yes, please. Do you mean, oh, you want to, yep, do you mean personal progress or collective progress? So when we are talking about in the process of uh, understanding desires and the, the role that the self plays on, we talk about sort of refining self-perception almost as we're calling something that that's trying to see things more clearly without flaws. I don't know if that's possible. Invariably, when you reach a point of understanding 
Well, of course, but, but we always have to see this problem from some particular standpoint, from the standpoint of some, some vision, some idea. So now, in this part of the course, we're examining these from the, from the standpoint of this project of self-invention and nonconformity. Uh, and I don't think it's fair to this project, uh, even given all the criticisms that we have explored, to see it simply as a form of narcissistic individualism. Uh, uh, it, its strength in the world as one of the two great moral projects now in contest in the world is that it is related to an objective imperative of these societies, of these advanced societies. The objective imperative is this imperative of the enhancement of agency. These are societies that in their advanced economic and political forms increasingly require the capable agent who can act not only within his context, but beyond his context and even against his context. And that's not just something about the individual. That's something about the society. It's the society that requires that kind of participant. Now, at the same time, this, this project is related on the other side to uh, a paradox of these societies, which is that even though they require the enhancement of agency, in their present form, they impose on the vast majority of their inhabitants an experience of belittlement, which is the negation of, of, of agency. And the popular use of the discourse of this project is as a quasi-heroic antidote to this experience of belittlement, as if it were a lifting of the spirit. So let me read you another passage from the, from the uh, German social theorist Peter Sloterdijk from a, from a little book about Nietzsche called Nietzsche Apostle. So this is the passage. He's, he's just spoken about this heroic characteristic of Nietzsche's view, the affirmation of the will in the struggle to disrupt. And this is what he says. In a general way, the modern tribute to heroes necessarily faces a complicating factor, namely that eulogistic functions are increasingly dependent on scientific premises and must satisfy the dictates of political correctness. Nowadays, you always have to have in view, to have in view the side effects of each tribute and to calculate the angle of refraction of indirect self-enhancement. The leeway for boasting shrinks. The strategy of indirect self-celebration in high culture hits the investor with ever greater costs and diminishing narcissistic returns. Summing up this state of affairs is the term humanism, such as ethicists use it today. To all speakers, it suggests the return to a carefully considered sort of self-affirmation that is only barely distinguishable from medium-level depression. 20th century mass culture would first designate a way out of this quandary by disconnecting self-praise from remarkable performance, 
admiration of which was based on superior criteria. This disconnection thus enabled primitive feelings of exhilaration to step onto the fourth stage, where a public of accomplices in disinhibition awaited, intent on cheering. So that's, <laughs> so that's, so that's the other side. So the, 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 the power of this project that we're discussing in its flawed and debased form has to do with all of this. It has to do with this Im immensely significant imperative of the enhancement of agency, which is required. For example, the advanced form of production, the knowledge economy, requires a more capable agent than the agent that exists today on a, on a, on a mass scale. But at the same time, there's this other side that the actual experience of social life for the vast majority is an experience of disempowerment and humiliation. And then the discourse of self-invention and nonconformity, rather than functioning as the expression of the objective imperative, functions as the balsam, as the solace, uh, as the pep talk. Uh, 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 in, in, in the society in which experience gives the lie to this, to this promise. So uh, this is all part of the real historical context in which this moral debate is taking place. And it makes it immensely more interesting because it's not just about a bunch of abstractions. Uh, it's about this, this real situation. So that's why I think it's, it's, it's inaccurate to speak of it simply as uh, a, f a forgetting of the social situation. It's about a real social situation, and it has all of these connections. Yes, yes. So this is one of the great themes of this culture from which this project of self-invention and nonconformity emerged. The theme is that the ordinary man and woman looked at more closely turns out to be not so ordinary after all. And that, the, and that their ordinary experiences of everyday life have within them the potential for the sublime. That's a, a central idea of democracy and of romanticism. Uh, and that the, the commonplace turns out to be more promising than the supposedly noble. And that's this radical transvaluation of values. So uh, that's all part of this revolutionary project that I said I'm, I'm sympathetic to, we should be sympathetic to, but that in order to make live, we have to reinvent. And we have to reinvent it in all its separate pieces, including its characteristic moral projects. Now, Michael, I was going to suggest, because we now have a spring recess coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, and we would go on to the discussion of, of Buddhism and Schopenhauer right after the recess. But I was, I was going to suggest that we use this, these last 20 minutes just to summarize mm -hmm. the exploration of this project and then continue the discussion after the break. Absolutely. So let me make in that spirit some, some remarks. So uh, understand that this, this project, this moral project that we're calling 
uh, self-invention and nonconformity has in the history of the high philosophical culture two main expressions. One expression is in the philosophical ideas of philosophers like Emerson and Nietzsche. And the other is expression is in the classical liberal political thinkers. We chose to focus on the first rather than on the second for two reasons. The first reason is that it's a more radical expression of these ideas. And the second reason is that it's specifically moral rather than primarily political. And our focus here in this course is moral, although the moral is connected with the political. Now then, first then to remind you of the characteristic content of the philosophical ideas. First, there's this conception of uh, a, a divine force, life, power, that flows through the individual members of humanity. And what is most important, what most deserves the name sacred, what has greatest valence and potency, is life in the present moment. Because that, in the end, is all we ever have. All we ever have is life right now. We don't live in the future or in the past. And therefore, our highest goal is to come into the possession of life, to have it really, uh, and, and to live until we die. Now, second then, what is the enemy, according to these thinkers? The enemy is routine, repetition, structure, conformity, and society to the extent that it represents all of those things. What is the method by which to face the enemy and affirm the good of life right now. Rebellion, disruption, nonconformity. Placing the nonconformist above the herd of the conformists. And what then is the reward? The reward is to overcome estrangement from the supreme good, which is life right now. And that is the estrangement that Nietzsche calls nihilism. Now then, a second set of ideas. What are the defects of this project in this radical philosophical formulation? Uh, we have identified at least five salient defects. So the first defect is a misrepresentation of our relation to the other people. We're not like these little Napoleons who crown themselves. We, can, we, we, we build ourselves through connection, although every connection imposes on us the threat of loss of distinction and loss of freedom. And so the question is, how, we, how, how can we connect without losing ourselves? And we may come to think in the sphere of intimacy through love and outside the sphere of intimacy through the development of the higher forms of cooperation. Second defect is a misrepresentation of the relation between the agent, the self, and the social world. Not just the others or the other, but the whole collective world. We can't be free in isolation as this isolated hero who struggles against society. 
we are free only to the extent that we can engage in a real social world. No one is free in isolation. But every engagement then threatens us with the danger of requiring, as the price of engagement, surrender to that world. And what would be necessary would be to be able to engage in that world without surrendering to it, so that we could be insiders and outsiders at the same time, denying the last word to that world and keeping the last word to ourselves. And that would then require a, a political transformation of that world. But in the absence of that political transformation, a series of, of moral strategies, of moral practices that allowed us, in the way we live, to make up for the failures of politics. Then the third defect of this project in its unreconstructed form is that it has no politics, or its politics is by default simply an elitist politics. And it would have to have a politics, because this kind of bigness that can be, is being evoked in the project is only for real to the extent that it can be a shared bigness. And then the question is, under what economic and political institutions that are not specified by the philosophers of this project? Then the fourth defect of this view is the defect that I call Prometheanism. So a denial of our frailty, of our vulnerability, and a pretense, a claim, not just to transcendence, but to omnipotence or omniscience, to, to being able somehow to overcome those inexorable uh, defects in the, in the human condition. And the fifth defect is the apparent emptiness of this project. We become more powerful, more free, and then what? Seems that, that in our existence, the real source of value, the moral weight, arises from particular engagements and particular connections in particular domains. And we therefore need a formulation of the view that does justice to that fact. Otherwise, it's empty. So from this criticism, there then arises a program to reshape this project, to reconstruct it, so that it would take on a form that addressed each of these deficiencies. Now then comes a third set of ideas emerging from our argument. We can, we can imagine then different ways, different vocabularies in which we could reshape this project and confront these defects. So it could take different forms. So one form would be a doctrine of the virtues. What are the virtues? The, the virtues are habitual dispositions to action. And in the history of philosophy, moral views have characteristically been expressed in the form of a doctrine of the virtues. The, the Aristotelian doctrine, the Christian theologians with their idea of virtues. And we would have to develop a doctrine of the virtues. The virtues of connection to other people, right? fairness, forbearance, respect, courage. The virtues of purification, in which we distinguish the central from the peripheral and become available to self-transformation. Simplicity, enthusiasm, attentiveness. And the higher virtues, the equivalent to the Christian theological virtues of faith, hope, and love, availability to the other person and availability to the new. It is by these virtues that we become more human by becoming more godlike. 
But that wouldn't be the only form that this, this, this moral view could take. It could take many other forms. For example, another form would be a, a narrative of how we would confront or could or should confront certain turning points in every human existence. First, that we discover that we're not the center of the world. Then that we discover that we're going to die. Then uh, in the early formation of the individual, that we have to choose a particular course of life and, in a sense, mutilate ourselves. Because no one is born to be just one particular thing. And then that this carapace of routine and compromise begins to form around us, the mummy within which we die. And we have to break up this mummy in order to continue living. So that would be another doctrinal form of this, of this view. Uh, and we have to have a background in order to be secure. It has to have a, a philosophical setting. I won't say a foundation. But it can't be either of the two major philosophical traditions in the world history of philosophy. It can't be the Greek philosophy of being with its idea that there's a permanent structure of constituents of the world and of regularities of nature that are exempt from time. And it can't be the speculative monism of ancient India or of philosophers like Schopenhauer, which denies the reality of the self, of the distinctions among selves, and, the real and denies the reality of time itself. It has to be a view that affirms that the, world, that the most important feature of the world is that it is what it is and not something else, and that time is real, and that history is open, and that the new is possible. And that philosophical view has never been explicitly developed at a level comparable to the level of those two other philosophical traditions. And it can't be a view that is complicit with the successive dualisms that have shaped the history of Western philosophy between nature and grace, between the mental and the physical, uh, between the presuppositions of human action and the nature of things in themselves, between nature and history. Because we can't see ourselves as just a miraculous exception to the way things are. So there's a whole project of philosophical reconstruction that would be part of the effort to reshape this, this agenda of nonconformity and self-invention. Now, suppose we did all of that. Suppose that we, that we revise this project so that it would deal with all of these deficiencies. It would still not lose its distinctiveness and its distinctive controversial character in many different ways. It would still not merge into the other project that we're going to discuss of collaboration and responsibility. First, it would always retain as its point of departure the perspective of the agent, of the individual agent. That's who we are, the embodied organism with a mind separated from other minds. And it's not self-evident that that should be the point of departure. The other project that we're going to examine in the context of Confucianism has as its point of departure what you could call joint intentionality, interaction, not the individual agent in mind. The second distinction that would remain at the end of the day is the affirmation of a, of a view of the self as transcendent over its context. That there's more in the self than there is in the context, always. The contexts are always finite in relation to us, and we are infinite in relation to them. The third distinction is that even in its reconstructed form, this project 
has an organic connection and to, the, to this revolutionary undertaking in the world. It's part of it. It's not neutral. It's not indifferent to the fate of that project, the one that I said put the world on fire for the last 300 years. It's one of its voices and would continue to be in this reconstructed form. And the fourth distinction that would remain is the privilege that it accords, a controversial privilege, to a particular kind of experience and a particular kind of temperament, which is the experience of disruption or rebellion, of iconoclasm, and the temperament of the disruptors. So it seems to me that even in this revised form, we continue to make a belief that is, at the very least, controversial and may seem even implausible, but will, 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 would continue to, 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 to be part of this reconstructed project. And that is that the, the disruptors are always the, the spiritual aristocracy of the human race. It's like that comment that I told you that I mentioned of Una Munoz in an earlier class. You know, Munoz says, the winners in the world are the ones who adapt to the world. The losers are the ones who demand that the world adapt to them. Those are the iconoclasts. And therefore, the advance of humanity rests on the shoulders of the losers. So, what we would have to believe to reconcile this with democracy is that this iconoclastic impulse, this prophetic power, rather than being reserved to an elite of visionaries, would be widely diffused in the whole of humanity. So that, the, the the project that would emerge from all of those corrections and criticisms would still be a distinctive project. And it would still be incendiary. Uh, and it would still be uh, it would still have it, it would still have its enemies. It wouldn't be some kind of lowest common denominator. And that's how I'm seeing, then, the inference from our argument. So projecting forward to what I imagine is that we would do the same operation with the other project of responsibility and solidarity. We would subject it to criticisms. We would revise it. But in its revised form, it would not simply merge with the revised form of this one. So the contest would persist. But the contest would persist in a different form, in a higher form, in which the, in which the two projects would, would, be, would be stronger, would have stronger claims on our allegiance. But they would still be in tension. Uh, and and that's very different from looking for some kind of definitive synthesis. That's looking for a transformation and enhancement of the conflict, a superior conflict, a superior set of contradictions, rather than, rather than a reconciliation and a convergence. Uh, I've talked down the clock, which is, uh, so we're, we're at the end. <laughs> but Michael, uh, so this is the basis that I propose for the beginning of our conversation two weeks from now. Have a good recess. <laughs> Have a great spring break. See you in two weeks. So what do you think?